The sages say to us that the first temple was destroyed because of three particular sins, idolatry, murder, and adultery. They go on to say that the second temple was then destroyed because of baseless hatred of one another, usually in the form of Lashon Hara, that is slanderous, gossiping, uh, vicious speech and accusations against one another. Hi, this is Barry Phillips with the final day of Tezrea Metzora, and let's examine the restoration process. The temple has been absent from us for these thousands of years, and now we are looking and hoping for the day of restoration. Will this just simply happen, or will there be a process? It's the same thing that we kind of hinted at all week in our study of one who has serot, that is the skin disease that reveals an inward spiritual malady. They're isolated, separated, quarantined to the outer parts of the camp, and there they are to remain until they are found to be tahor, to be clean. But once they are found to be clean, it's not simply that they are led back into the camp and they can go back and say, I'm home. There has to be a process. When a high priest or a priest goes out and he looks at one who is a metzora, who has serat, then he examines and finds that he is now clean of this malady. He pronounces him tahor. This next part is the part of restoration. One who has been um, unclean that is now clean may be similar in our minds to our experience of being born again. Remember our past life, our previous sins, they're all forgiven. They're washed from us. We're a brand new creature in Messiah Yeshua. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are new men in Messiah. Hallelujah. That fixes everything, right? And our life from then on is just wonderful, right? You and I both know that the old man lives in the backyard of our souls and he seeks to rise up and show himself at every given opportunity. Perhaps it is because we really are not granted traditionally a process of being restored that we we find ourselves failing in that clear mark of delineation between what we were and who we're to be. When one is born again, there needs to be that process by which they learn to embrace their new life. It's not an automatic thing. Well, just pray, read your Bible, and come to our congregation on a regular basis. You and I both know that that's not enough. Even when we came out of whatever denominational systems that we may have been a part of, and we began to keep feast days, and wear to lead and have a keep, and put tzitzit on our pants, and and uh, start speaking Hebrew words, keeping Shabbat, it doesn't fix everything. It's new, it's invigorating, it's life-changing, it's helpful, it's major steps in the right direction. But all of us understand that there are plenty of folks who do these things that they have never really changed. Why? And is it possible that this lack of meaningful life-giving change has never really taken place that we're not restored to a place where we have a temple. Will the temple be held from us until we're willing to be restored ourselves? That, my friend, is the key question for today. So let's look at the restoration process. An earthen vessel, a clay pot, is filled with a source of living water, waters that are moving. This is not waters that stand still in a pond, but these are waters that have been moving. They're placed in the vessel, and two living birds are sourced. One is slain, and its blood is then poured into the living water. The living bird is then immersed into this water, is pulled out, blood-stained, and released to experience a free life. The old has been passed away, plunged beneath the blood, 
brought up in a resurrected newness of life. And though we are blood stained, we have liberty to live. What a beautiful picture of being processed, restored, and changed. This is also a picture for us of Yeshua, who in a clay vessel, a human form, was nonetheless a container of living waters. Remember he said to the woman at the well in Yochanan, or John chapter 4, how that he was, in fact, the Messiah. He said, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you would ask of me for living water. And you would drink of these waters and you would never thirst again. The woman says, sir, give me these waters that I never have to come back here and draw again. He then dealt with her issues hmm, and offered her a process of restoration. <coughs> As the ritual continues, then we find also that um, uh, Cedar, hyssop, and a wool thread dyed red are used. Wool comes from a lamb. Hmm. Perhaps we see a picture then of the lamb of Elohim, dyed or stained red as with blood. Hmm. Hyssop, that which applied blood to the lentil and doorpost of the, land, of the houses of Israel in the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt on the night of Pesach, deliverance. The, the setting apart of the firstborn as a priest for the family. Hmm. It is then tied with the uh, scarlet thread to cedar. Now, I'm going to venture outside the lines here a bit. You're very welcome to disagree with me here. I'm not going to argue about it. This is my thought, my thinking. I believe that Yeshua was nailed to an olive tree on the Mount of Olives that uh, it's very easy that the limbs could have been chopped off at the top, leaving four branches, and then that Yeshua, maybe, in my estimation, I think the picture fits, was carrying a cedar crossbeam, and he was then affixed to that crossbeam, which was then placed in the cropped-out branches of the olive tree, and his feet actually nailed to its trunk. The picture of our Messiah bleeding and dying on an olive tree, which is the symbol of Israel while overlooking the Temple Mount, is a fascinating idea to me. Maybe it's fanciful, maybe it's correct, maybe it's neither. Uh, not to argue or debate, it's an idea. It's a picture. The two thieves are nailed to the same tree, one given an opportunity or both given an opportunity to become part of our Israel. One accepts, one rejects. What a powerful picture. Nevertheless, these three items, the wool string, the hyssop, the cedar, are also plunged into the waters. I also see then that the, this is possibly a picture of the two advents of Messiah, as Messiah, the son of Yosef, who came, bled, and died, to make way for Messiah ben David, the one and the same, who comes back victorious as a king, his garments dipped in blood the book of Revelation describes. It's also perhaps a picture of the two houses, one Yehuda offering a servant who will bleed and die so that the other house, Ephraim, who has been dispersed into the world, could find his place, be restored, and brought home. So the Metzora enters into the camp. He is completely shaved. His eyebrows, his arm hair, his facial hair, his leg hair, everything is shaved. He is the, then likened to a Nazarite who has completed their vow, has had their bodies shaved, their hair burned, and then they're held in high esteem and respect in the community as one who has been very much set apart. So there is a picture not only of restoration and being able to go home, but of elevation. Being redeemed and delivered from our past should not give us just a a, a small step over into a new life. It ought to propel us into a completely means of new being. <clears throat> so let the power of Yeshua's deliverance propel us. Shabbat shalom to you.
I appreciate you watching these these videos. If they're helpful to you and you will want to support, you can go to remnantofisrael.com, click the donate button, and it's much appreciated. Until next week, shalom.